welcome to Goodfellas History. I'm your host, Nick. I'm Davis. And I'm Garrett. And today we're going to talk about the rise of the new empires, or better known as the old empires. What we're really going to get into is the Iberian Gambit, the Portuguese investments from the, that gambit, and Spanish conquests. So, the beginning of the new imperial age began in 1492 in the Iberian Peninsula. As you can see here, the kingdoms of Aragon and Castile um, were basically the two most powerful states that existed on the peninsula. And then you have Little Portugal right there. And Little Portugal is actually the body that uh, really changes uh, the name of the game. From mm -hmm. uh, their capital of Lisbon, uh, the Portuguese began a slow but sure transition of exploration down the coast of Africa. So, Portugal's African connection. Portugal goes down the coast of Africa, and the funny thing is that there are actually people living in Africa. I don't know if you guys knew that. Oh, yeah. Wow, shocking really? Shocking right there. And, oh, my God. Uh, in fact, some of these people lived in highly sophisticated, advanced civilizations that were incredibly wealthy and productive and powerful. And it was almost as if the Portuguese could use pre-existing infrastructure to further their goals, like going to those ports and trading goods at those ports and going back to Portugal. So we have this nice little map, and this map we'll keep coming back to. Um, the orange segments of the map um, are places where Portugal basically settled. And I want you guys to really focus on the west coast of Africa here, the initial part. Because in there, in that part of Africa, was an incredibly powerful country named Mali. The African state of Mali, how the, the Mali kingdom helped the Portuguese expand their trade networks. But they also did something else. The Malinese connection um, started the Atlantic slave trade. So one of the first most profitable things the Portuguese were able to bring back from Africa uh, apart from salt and gold, was actually slaves. Now, there's a nice little map here where we can kind of see Mali, Songhai, Mossi, these kingdoms here. By the time the Portuguese really began their expeditions in the late 14th century, early 15th century, you can see here Mali is the most powerful state. And I want you guys to look at the, the cities there, Timbuktu, Jene, and Gao. Timbuktu at its height was by far and away probably one of the most prosperous places in the world um, with incredibly powerful, with a very powerful king or emperor. Um, so they started this, sorry, real quick, they started this in 1492? No, that's, that's just an important date that like we all remember with, Af with uh, Columbus. But the Portuguese actually began their explorations um, in the late 1300s. Okay, just with the dates because you said that Mali, Songhai, all that, mm -hmm. then it became Mali being a bigger thing, but the dates are mm -hmm. kind of flipped in that mm -hmm. regard. So Mali used to be the more powerful state. Then by okay. 1530, okay. and I wanted to point that out, by 1530, Mali had reduced in power. Okay. And some of this was due to the fact that trade with Portugal now was a more common thing. And I want you guys to notice the fact that these territories on the coasts broke up. Yeah. Wolof, Sien, and Turkur um, might have been helped in their, you know, ambition to become independent. So this slave trade from Africa to the Americas, I know the dates are a little bit off, but I really want you guys to look at this. Primarily focus on West Africa. So the West African slave trade was dominated by the Portuguese. And a lot of the infrastructure that opened the door to the slave trade from Africa to the Americas were opened up by the Portuguese. The Portuguese themselves didn't take on too much of a territory or too much land, but they would begin to implement infrastructure inside the pre-existing ports. These ports, these Portuguese ports inside the ports of these, these uh, nation states usually operated independently and the Portuguese paid a fee to the local ruler to basically operate. We'll come back to that. Okay. 
Now, the Portuguese really are focused on this place called India. In fact, everybody seems to want to get to India, even this fellow named Columbus. Now, I want people to really understand India. The Indian history has kind of always been left on the by and by. And I think a lot of it is just due to the fact that as Americans, we really don't have that much direct history with the state of India. But India was, in many ways, the land of opportunity, the land of spices, the land of gold and dreams in this period of time. So, as you can see here, India between the years 1450 and 1650 had two really time, two really powerful states that really formed. Um, the first of these states would be the Mughal Empire. Now, the Mughals are an interesting bunch. They are actually the successors of the Mongols. Um, the Mongols would conquer a bunch of Persia, this territory right here, and most of what we consider modern-day Asia. And uh, they, uh, their empire lasted from 1562 to 1720. Um, important thing to note is that a territory of land known as Afghanistan was actually the initial heart of the Mughal Empire. The Mughals themselves were successors of Timur. And Timur was, of course, a successor of the Mongols. Now, Timur Lane is an important figure because he basically was a Genghis Khan-like figure in the late to mid 14th century. Unimportant for our narrative right now, um, one of his successors by the name of Babar basically ends up conquering most of northern India. And then one of his successors named Akbar uh, basically conquered this territory land that you see here on the map. That's a lot of India, right? Yeah, that's a good portion of it right there. This is the first time in centuries that this much territory of land was dominated by one state. Now, the important thing about the Mughals is that they were Muslim, whereas India is predominantly Hindu and is still to this day. And I want you guys to take a look at this. The territory land where the Mughals come from is modern-day Afghanistan and Pakistan. At one point, Babar's capital was Kabul which is the capital of Afghanistan right now. Um, kind of shows you how things are interconnected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, the Delhi was once ruled by the Ladai family, which was a Muslim sultanate. Hmm. So Muslim-Hindu tensions is something that's been around for a long time. Yeah. Now, I really like this map here, because this kind of just shows you the arc of things. It gives you the dates in which the Portuguese were able to found their colonies or their trade ports. And as you can see with a very small amount of land that the Portuguese were interested in. But their way of making money and bringing in the, the moolah from India was working down the West African coast. Now you can see here, right? Yeah. It's slowly but surely you see these colonies spring up. And then right before Columbus and his expedition, you see a ton of development on the west coast of Africa. After Columbus goes out west, you see an explosion of Portuguese holdings in the Indian Sea. Yeah. Initially, Portugal is the victor in the, what we can consider the space race, but in reality, the colonial race for India. Now, I want you guys to look at Ethiopia. Ethiopia is going to be really important when I talk about next week, the consequences of this, and how this basically transitioned to the next phase of colonialism. Ethiopia is right at the point of the Red Sea, and 1493 is when the Portuguese settle some sort of colony or some sort of trade port on the island in there in Ethiopia. So a year after Columbus goes out west. Their ports that the Portuguese are able to establish here are far more lucrative and productive. Because, well, they're, it's, they're actually making it to India where the Spanish really weren't. They were making it into the Americas. 
So initially, yeah. the, the Portuguese look like they are set to dominate, correct? Yeah, yeah. This is another nice map of that. Problem. As short as it seems to go from Lisbon to Calcutta, in fact, there's a lot of problems with this route, particularly when it comes to seasonal winds. So there are times of year where you're able to go from Africa to India or down the coast of Africa. And that really cuts into shipments. More importantly, the reason why there's so many ports that they have to gain access to, every single one of those ports, the Portuguese have to pay a small fee to keep going. And if it's multiple different states that they have to work with, you could see how this can kind of begin to steamroll or snowball down the hill. So even though it looks shorter, it actually might take longer to go from Lisbon to Calcutta. Yeah. So. We go back to the slave trade map. The Spanish, on the other hand, where do they go? To the Americas. To the Americas. And the thing is, is that it's really easy to go from Spain to the Americas, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Not as many problems. Another yeah. fun thing is, what did the Spanish begin to do? They conquered. They conquered yeah. first the Caribbean islands, then they conquered the Aztecs, the Incans. And I guys want you to take a look at down to the left. Rice, mining, sugar, cotton, coffee, tobacco. What are those? Yeah. Resources. They're very lucrative resources. Particularly the mining. Some people believe that somewhere around 30% of the world's silver circulation came from this region alone. Well, wow. And who owns that during this period of time? That's all Spain, Spain. baby. Spain. Spain now has silver and, and expenses, right? Yeah. They also begin to have ports. So what do the Spanish begin to do? They facilitate these resources, particularly the silver. The Portuguese, they have Brazil, and there's some lucrative trade there. But the Spanish begin to bring in a buttload of Slaves. slaves. Tons and tons of slaves. And this is when the Atlantic slave trade becomes incredibly lucrative. So, yeah. from Africa, from these initial contacts with the Portuguese, the slave trade has turned into a major commodity for these regions. You can see how that could become a little bit destabilizing to these regions as well, right? Because large really? proportions of their population are being taken out of these areas and shipped to yeah. somewhere else. Yeah, that'll do it. Now I want you guys to take a look at Cartagena, Lima, and Valparaiso. Buenos Aires. These ports are going to be really important ports. Yeah. So now we need to talk about the ultimate destination for all of this. The Krim, the real reason why Europeans went out and went out looking for a path to the east. Let's talk about the Ming Dynasty. Now, I've learned a lot about Chinese history, and I might actually do a, a nice little video about this one of these days. But the important thing to know about the Ming Dynasty is that at the time that the Portuguese and Spanish came into contact with the Ming, um, this was the most powerful empire in the world. The amount of wealth, the amount of manpower, the economy, the system of government was by far and away one of the most advanced places in the world. This was the yeah. center of the world. The only countries that possibly could rival the Ming in power and prestige was the Mughal Empire and the Ottoman Empire. Now, what do you yeah. note about these two, these empires? They're, they're not European, correct? Yeah, no. definitely not. The Ming is the end goal of trade because it's a land of silks, spices, and everything nice. 
Silks, spice, and everything nice come from China. Yeah. Now, this is Calcutta, or Calcutta. In order to get from Calcutta to China, you have to deal with the monsoon winds again. And sucks. <laughs> you notice that there are these islands in the Java Sea. There's this city called Bangkok. These are going to become really important trade routes for the Portuguese and for the British and the Dutch and the French once they start getting involved in this. And I want you guys to notice Calcot and the area of the Ganges, this Bay of Bengal. It's going to be really important for next week. Yeah. Then you have these ports right here, uh, Guangzhou, Fazu, Changxi, and Guangzhou. Guangzhou is going to be really important for next week. So for the time being, these are ports that are open up to Western traders, but they're highly controlled by the Ming. Yeah. Why? Because you see this port of Nanjing right here? That's actually the capital or sometime capital of the Ming dynasty. Now we go to this next map. And I want you guys to take a real good look at this next map because I really love this one. See this green map? The green line? Mm -hmm. They have yep. to go, the Portuguese have to go down, then they got to go to Gao, and they got to hope they made it in time to go to Malacca, and then they have go to Macau. Because initially, eventually, the Chinese basically tell them that that's the only port they're able to trade in, but they get a lot more liberties in that trade. Then there's another Asian country known as Japan. And there's a port city known as Nagasaki. 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 It's going to be really important when, if we ever talk about Japanese history. Yeah. Now let's talk about the Spanish. You see this straight line that they, they, they go from the, the from Acapulco to Manila and back? Much easier. A yeah. lot easier. More importantly, there are these islands. What are they called? Which ones? The Philippines. Mm -hmm. Named oh, after yeah. King Philip Hello. of Spain. <laughs> so, very quickly, Manila displaces Macau as the major trading hub. And what do the Spanish have? They have a lot of sh they have a shit ton of silver, don't they? Oh yeah, yeah. And you notice how Apalaco is right next to the silver mines? Do you think that's by accident? Yeah. Oh, definitely oh. not. And what's funny yeah. is that, like from Apalaco, it's a lot easier to sail down the coast of the Pacific and up the Atlantic than it is to go into the Indian Ocean because they're not as tied to the seasonal winds. Hmm. They're tied down by seasonal storms, but there's a lot more freedom. More importantly, it's a lot easier to go from Apalaco to Spain, isn't it? Oh, yeah. So it's easier yeah. to go from Apalaco, have a land route, and then go to Spain than it is to go from Manila to Lisbon. Or Macau to Lisbon. So... Why do these countries trade with Western Europe? I mean, they really not, doesn't seem like we have a lot to offer them, right? We don't have say, spices. Yeah. We don't have we don't have all well, these nice things. And eventually, the Spanish conquer territories where they get coffee and cotton and things. But I mean, the Chinese and the Indians have tea. They have cotton. They have silk. You know. So what, well, what I what I understand, Japan doesn't have natural resources, right? Not a lot. Yeah, so that, I mean, that's, silk? that's an incentive to actually get stuff they don't have. Mm -hmm. But, you guys see this musket? This aquabush? Yeah. yeah. It's Portuguese make. It's from this time period. Mm -hmm. oh, so they just had all the guns. What do we call when we send a ship to a port that's not open to trade? And we say, we want you to trade with us, pretty please. 
What kind of diplomacy is that called? Or being nice about it? No, it's called gunboat diplomacy. So, the Europeans were able to muscle their way in to trade by basically saying that if you don't trade with us, then we'll take over your goddamn port and we'll blockade your port. So if you're a local you governor, no one. you're a local city mayor, what would you rather have? A you know country that trades goods and resources that you might not need to trade and not get sacked? Then it would to you know actually fight against them yeah, yeah definitely you're like oh welcome funny thing <laughs> is that the portuguese had these things called caravels and these may not look much but at the time these were right far away some of those advanced ships out there and more importantly these yeah. were ships that carried a shit ton of guns in comparison to their counterparts yeah most of the cities in question most likely didn't have cannons. And if they did, they probably were pretty old. Or if these Portuguese, these were usually state-of-the-art cannons that were on these caravels. Yeah. So they could bomb out, bombard down walls. They could block trade. They could become pirates. But the Portuguese had something that the Indians and the Chinese wanted. So did the Spanish. It was called silver. We want to buy shit from you, and you're going to let us buy shit from you, or we're going to blow your head off. It really does sound like an offer you can't refuse now, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah exactly. Almost wonders why they, they, why they didn't just take what they wanted. Well, this gets down to the fact then... that in these ports, I mean, you could take it once. You can't take everything, but what you take, you take once, but then next time around, it might not be as easy. They might Let's be understand prepared, that the Portuguese yeah. were interested in trade. They wanted yeah. silks, they wanted spice, they wanted these things. And it's a lot easier to get a bee with honey than with vinegar, right? Yeah. So, let's talk about early trade. This is kind of the... ...to get hammered home. The wealth of the Americas founded, or funded, or no, founded the growth of European trade. Without yeah. the silver, the cotton, the coffee, the chocolate, and the slave trade, Europe, particularly the Iberian Peninsula, would not have been able to expand their trade routes. Because let's go back to this port, to this. Let's look at all these trade routes that were founded after the Americas were found. Yeah. It's a shit ton, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's almost as if the slave trade coupled with the race to the New World really motivated the expansion of these ports. Mm. Now, American silver fuels India's wealth. Now, you guys see this picture, right? What's this picture of? Uh... It's not the. Is it the Taj Mahal? I was going to yep, say it's, it's not the. Taj the Mahal. Ta it is the Taj Mahal, really. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's I was I was sure, but I didn't want to like mess it up and then sound kind of stupid. <laughs> the silver that went into financing the Taj Mahal was the same silver that was processed in South America. Hmm. The silver that the Spanish and the Portuguese bring to to India funded the Taj Mahal. The irony of this is that the wealth of the Indians in India is fueled by the loss of wealth and the deprivation of Indians in the Americas. Also, slaves. Lots and lots of slaves. Also, yeah. the wow. silver trade expands and fuels China's capital market. Because the Chinese, unlike many other states at this time, actually have a silver standard. And a huge influx of silver into China actually expands their capital market. This would eventually lead to major systemic issues, as inflation would become more and more problem of the for the Chinese. Any questions, guys? No, I mean this is pretty like straightforward so far. Yeah. Any enlightenment? 
what said. was that? It kind of shows you why kind of the big powers right now kind of... I mean, maybe this is wrong, but why, like it's kind of setting these countries up to be big powers like they are today, like China, mm -hmm. you know, the U.S. A lot of a lot well, of stuff like built like hundreds of years ago at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the important thing I really want you guys to take a look at is that this is a far more nuanced reality than we're often taught in our history books. Usually, uh -huh. the export the early ages of empire are basically summed up in two ways. One is the barbaric Europeans moving out west doing really barbarous things, which they, they, they did. A lot of barbarous shit. Um, but the Portuguese story is often kind of forgotten. Yeah. We learn about Columbus, but we don't learn about Vasco da Gama. Yep. Right? We yeah, learn I about... I don't even know who that is. <laughs> yeah. Look him up. So we learn about this. And, uh, yeah, there's there's so much more to this. And the important thing is that this actually sets up the next phase that will come into existence. Because, funny enough, this was an incredibly lucrative market. And lucrative markets always attract competitors. Ooh, there you go. And so the politics and the history of these regions are changed forever with the introduction of the Americas. To this yeah. day, like the amount of wealth that was extracted from South America, from Central America, from Mexico is still uncalculated. But it's probably worth trillions of modern day dollars. It was extracted well, from these places and sent to Europe, sent to India, and sent to China. Wow. Without the founding finding of the, the Americas, the likelihood of the Portuguese trade empire succeeding the way it did and the expansion of Iberia and the creation of what we call modern-day Europe probably wouldn't have taken place. Yeah. It's kind of interesting to think about how how these places that had the wealth extracted, how it would have turned out if they had the better technology. Yeah, that's they, what I was thinking about. They didn't get pushed around by Europe. I mean, mm -hmm. they probably would be deleting the world today, mm -hmm. most likely. Mm-hmm. So, they were able to use their own resources. Mm -hmm. That's the thing, is their own resources. <laughs> so, it's kind of food for thought, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. So, but like I said, in the, the second story is we often get just like this very callous, cold, detached narrative of trade routes. But I want people to really think about this. This is a generational thing. This didn't just happen overnight. Like, initially the, the Portuguese traders weren't slave traders. And the early slave trade was very minimal because there was very few markets. But over decades and generations of basically treating people like cattle, the Portuguese, then the Spanish, then the British and the French, and then the Americans began to look at these slaves as subhuman. Yeah. And they began to rationalize this. Without that slave trade, the likelihood of Spain being able to extract as much wealth as it had and as it was able to um, was most likely it would, wouldn't have. It wouldn't have succeeded. It would have taken yeah. much longer. Yeah, unfortunately, that makes sense. So, and the consequences of that on the local populations of West Africa is something we also don't talk about as well. So this is kind of yep. why the 1619 project is really important, at least in my mind, because mm -hmm. it brings up these important questions on relations of power and, you know, who the real victims of this period of time were. Yeah. So. Interesting. Any, yeah, uh, very interesting. Any, yeah, uh, very informative. Any questions? Any closing thoughts? No, and I mean, I definitely think like the closing thoughts for me will be coming down the road when we learn more about like, about, like, like the deeper, I guess, mm -hmm. how like the colonies and whatnot were like kind of stomping on other regions. But mm -hmm. it's just yeah. it's interesting to see. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think this is you know pretty well put together. I mean, I don't. It, it makes sense, and you know, learned a little bit more about Portugal's involvement because yeah, we mostly kind of just learned about Spain, so mm -hmm. I thought it was 
Yeah, Spain so they're, usually they're is very a nice good presentation. Yeah. Awesome. So, well, this has been Goodfellas history. If you like what you saw and what you heard, please like, comment, and subscribe down below. And as always, have a wonderful day. Bye, guys. Bye, guys.